Welcome everyone to the Geneva Historical Society's February program. My name is Carrie Lippincott and I'm the Executive Director of the Geneva Historical Society. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, we were just talking about how nice it is to stay at home on a snowy evening like tonight. So uh, you don't have to get out, you can get all comfy uh, in your living rooms. Uh, many of you probably are very familiar with Zoom by now, but I just want to go over a few things. Um, when everybody was came into the program, they were put on mute and I asked that everybody except for the speaker stay on mute. Um, and you can be on mute by going to the bottom left hand corner of your screen. Um, and there's a little micro there's a little microphone you can click on that to put yourselves on mute that just cuts um, cuts back on any background noise that you may have. The other thing too is um, we're going to if you have questions at any time during the program, you can put them in the chat box. And the chat box looks like a little um, word bubble and you can uh, type in your questions or comments throughout the program and daily. Our director of education is gonna be moder monitoring that throughout the uh, evening. So at the end, some time has been set aside to answer uh, any and all questions that there might be. Again, I wanna thank you so much for joining us this morning or this evening. I should, uh, <laughs> I'm still at work, so it feels like it's morning. Um, <laughs> and I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, he's at home. <laughs> yeah. I, I am going to remind everybody to please put yourselves on mute if you are not already so that we don't have any background noise while Preston is doing the presentation. Um, I again, want to welcome everyone to our virtual uh, lecture space, our virtual Hawker Gallery, I guess we could say. Um, and just like I do in our lifetime lectures, I've got our advertisements. I want to remind people that the museum, the Geneva History Museum is open. We have limited capacity, uh, but we can have visitors come in to see exhibits. And we do have exhibits currently up, including an educated citizenry education in Geneva, which is through April of this year. And we have our community curator cabinet, which is a rotating uh, set of collections from people in the community who have uh, graciously lent them to us to put on display. So if you have a collection you'd like to share, please contact John Marks. Uh, he'd be happy to know. Currently we have a collection of Karen Kalizzi Noonan's theater models and she is a huge theater buff. So those will be very interesting to see if you get a chance to do that. Uh, also, we have My Geneva Is, which is a community collection. Uh, we've asked people to submit photographs that represent what Geneva is to them and give us a caption. And that exhibit is up uh, through June 26th. So do stop by when you have an opportunity. There's not a lot of things you can do these days. And we don't have large crowds, so you should be safe. Masks are, of course, required. If you have a question, they, I can type it in and they'll answer it after. Yes. And for our uh, spring fundraiser, we will have uh, an online auction. So we are looking for donations. If anybody thinks they might have something appropriate to donate for the auction, please contact us at the museum. Um, we'd very much like those donations. It will be uh, in March for taking donations through March 12th. We also have a uh, slate of programs still coming up. We have one, or sorry, two more history sandwiched in lunchtime programs. The March one is John Mark speaking on from grain to grapes, drain tile over the years. And that'll be March 3rd uh, from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. We also have the rest of our, our lecture series coming up, uh, March, April, and May. Our program in March is the director of the Yates County Historical Society, Tricia Noel, and she'll be talking about their new exhibit, A Dangerous Freedom, Abolitionists, Freedom Seekers, and the Underground Railroad in Yates County, and that's on March 23rd. Uh, April 14th, we have Ronnie Frischman talking about the suffrage cartoonist Nina Allender. And May 4th, Suzanne Schnittman will be coming uh, virtually <laughs> to the museum to talk about 19th century women's rights leaders as mothers and daughters. So those are the things we've, we've got scheduled so far. Most of them are not on the website yet, but will be in the next week or so. So keep your eyes open. Um, if you do not get notifications about our events, sign up for our updates through our website and that way you'll get regular notifications. If you want a little bit further uh, timeline out, sign up for the press releases. Those come out sooner than the, the updates. So uh, enough of me, I'm not the one you came here to talk to. Uh, so I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Preston Pierce, and he is the Ontario County Historian, Museum Educator at the Ontario County Historical Society and Museum, and teaches at Finger Lakes Community College. 
He is also a retired social studies teacher in the Victor Central School District, and we have had him come and speak on a number of topics over the year. Uh, tonight, he is talking on the topic of remembering the Orange Limited, the Rochester and Eastern Rapid Railway. And so I will turn it over to Preston. Thank you and good evening and uh, appreciate everyone uh, having as much interest as I do in the R&E. Let me uh, start off really by making a couple of comments about this uh, title slide. Uh, this is actually a publicity photo that the Rochester and Eastern uh, turned into a postcard. They did five of those. You're gonna see a few more later on. Uh, to emphasize exactly what the caption says here, the old and the new. The Rochester and Eastern was one of many interurban uh, electric railroads that were built around the United States, especially in the Northeast, right at the turn of the 20th century. And it uh, incorporated one of the real marvels of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and that was the application of electricity to all sorts of labor-saving devices and conveniences like a rapid railway. And it was much more rapid than the steamroads were. It was something that people thought of in contrast to what had been pretty standard throughout uh, three quarters of the 19th century. And around here, <clears throat> that meant the Erie Canal, the towpath canal that you can see here. Actually, we know where this picture was taken. The r and &E crossed the Erie Canal only two, time, two times. Uh, one was uh, at Bushnell's Basin, if you're familiar with uh, Richardson's restaurant there, the uh, abutments for the bridge across the canal are still standing right next to the parking lot at Richardson's. And this one, this, uh, this was in a little bit further at a place called Rollins uh, <clears throat> at the edge of uh, the town of Brighton. And actually, uh, when the Erie Barge Canal was built uh, in 1918, uh, the uh, canal was rerouted around Rochester, and this part of the canal ceased to be a canal. It eventually became part of the Rochester subway system for a few years, and the R&E cars were actually routed up the subway into downtown Rochester. And now, if you were to stand where this bridge was, and, and uh, it can be identified, uh, and you looked in the direction of this scene, instead of a barge being towed by horses and an electric trolley, you would see the cars on Route 490. So it is in every sense of the, of the term still uh, a place where you can see the old and the new. Well, our story of the Rochester and Eastern Rapid Railway really starts with a horse car line established in Canandaigua in 1886. The first horse-drawn streetcar appeared on the streets of that village less than a year after the line's incorporation as the Canandaigua Street Railway. The main line of the Canandaigua Street Railway led down the middle of Main Street from the northern village limits all the way to the lake. The size, pace, and power of the horse cars fit right in. For village residents, Hopping on one of the horse cars was much easier than hitching up your own wagon or carriage. It was also a lot cleaner than walking, as you can see here. A group of enterprising men formed the Street Railway Company, laid the tracks, and began operating the line. The original car barn was later converted to a residence that still stands on North Main Street. You can see the place where the cars rolled in and out because of the different color of bricks on the face of the building today. And in the lower left part of your screen, you can see a, a picture of that house that I took just uh, maybe six months ago. In the meantime, when all of this was happening, Frank J. Spray, a graduate of the Naval Academy and a budding engineer had left the Navy in 1883 and was working for Thomas Edison on applications of electricity to transportation. 
The next year, Sprague left Edison's company and founded the Sprague Electric Railway and Motor Company. Shortly after that, Sprague patented two inventions, a spark-free electric motor and a regenerative braking system that actually used the power of the motor to assist in braking. He also developed an improved system by which a streetcar could use a turning trolley device for collecting power from the overhead wires. And that device is what gives all of these electric cars, the streetcars and the interurban cars, the nickname trolley. In 1888, Sprague built the first successful electric street railway in Richmond, Virginia. Very shortly after that, he and other entrepreneurs began building trolley lines all across the Northeast. Sprague's ideas spread quickly. Some of them were applied to larger railroad locomotives that used electric power to operate in the heart of cities where steam and smoke would have been unacceptable even by the lax standards of the 19th century. In 1890, Sprague sold his company to Thomas Edison and turned to the development of elevators. I guess you could say that's another form of electric transportation. But he is best remembered as the father of the electric streetcar. As Sprague's ideas were catching on, local entrepreneurs were working to install electric street lighting <clears throat> in local communities like Rochester, Canandaigua, and Geneva. They often turned the development of their projects over to larger national electric companies that combined the development of electrical power and light with trolley systems. In 1893, the Canandaigua Electric Light and Railroad Company built a generating station into an existing improved dam at Littleville on Canandaigua Outlet near the village of Shortsville. That company, bought the franchise for the horse car company and began electric streetcar service in Canandaigua. The Canandaigua Electric Light and Street Railroad Company began serving the community in 1894. Village residents began enjoying the benefits of electricity in their homes, if they could afford it, and if the lines had been strung. In 1894, new electric trolley cars began operating over the old horse car line. The dinky, as it was popularly known in town, was the king of Main Street for nearly a decade. In 1900, the first electric railroad company was sold to a group of investors who formed the Ontario Light and Traction Company. Those investors, most of whom were from out of state, had a special interest in the local streetcar company. It was the company franchise and the privileges it entailed. Geneva officials were also moving to light the city streets with electricity in the late 1880s. The Geneva Brush Electric Light and Power Company was established in Geneva in 1889 by a competitor of the Thompson Houston Company that developed the power potential at Littleville for Canandaigua. One of the principles in the development of Geneva power and streetcars was Clifford Beebe, founder of the Beebe Syndicate, so-called in Syracuse, a major regional developer of electric power and railroads. As it did in Canandaigua, the development of electric power for the city of Geneva also resulted in the development of an associated electric streetcar line. Unlike the Canandaigua streetcars, however, the Geneva line never became part of the larger Rochester and Eastern or New York State Railways operations. It was always under the control of business rivals and the r and &E did not need any of the franchise privileges of the Geneva streetcar line. The streetcars in both Canandaigua and Geneva did provide important transportation connections, however. 
The Geneva Line connected major streets with both the New York Central and Lehigh Valley Railroad stations. It also provided Geneva residents with easy access to the R&E station on Lower Castle Street. In 1900, A.L. Parker, a former Naples resident then living in Detroit, returned to his home area promoting the construction of a larger, longer, interurban trolley line connecting Rochester with Canandaigua and Geneva. Working with a few local entrepreneurs, principally Oscar N. Crane of Canandaigua, Parker informally organized the Rochester and Eastern Rapid Railway. The New York State Railway Commission approved the plan for the line in 1901, and in 1902, the Comstock Hay Walker Company was organized in Michigan to build the line, having bought out Parker's old company. Construction began just north of Canandaigua that year. While the building of the R&E went fairly smoothly, there were some problems. While we may see trolley lines through rose-colored glasses in retrospect, something akin to a benign amusement park ride, perhaps, they were sometimes controversial in their own day. Residents of Victor did not like the original route chosen down High Street. Canandaigua residents did not care for the idea that the trolley company might cut down the stately elm trees lining North Main Street or move unsightly freight cars into the business district. And residents of Geneva were not happy about the proposal for replacing a wooden bridge over the Naples branch of the Lehigh Valley Railroad on Castle Street. Steam railroads just didn't like the competition for passengers and often blocked the electric roads from crossing their tracks, at least until the issue had gone to court several times. Mrs. Mary Clark Thompson was so infuriated by the plans of the R&E in Canandaigua that she sent word from Europe that she would contribute $10,000 to pay the court costs of fighting the company. The bankers, lawyers, and engineers working for the Comstock Hay Walker Company were able to overcome all obstacles and provide a well-built infrastructure for the R&E. In fact, it was so well-built that remnants of the R&E line can still be found. One set of bridge abutments near Fishers still bears the clear imprint of the Comstock Hay Walker Company. That's the picture you see on the left. The tradition of a solid infrastructure continued for the life of the line, as you can see in the image on the right. When the R&E was merged into New York State Railways, the industry standard cedar power poles were replaced with poles made of reinforced cast concrete. Few of them remain today, but for half a century, their sturdy quality was unmistakable. A block signal system was installed on the R&E in 1913 by the General Railway Signal Company of Rochester. Use of block signals improved safety. It also improved efficiency and profits. The block signals allowed the R&E to begin using two cars coupled together and operated as trains. Rapid was a good word for part of the R&E's full name, the Rochester and Eastern Rapid Railway. It connected several important villages and lots of rural road crossings between Rochester and Geneva. Its riders a century ago could get into downtown Rochester as fast as drivers can today for only a small fare. And in this, uh, slide, you can see the names of many of the, of the stops, especially the crossroads stops that uh, R&E cars would make on their way to and from Rochester and Geneva. The line east of Canandaigua was finally completed in June 1904. 
the first interurban car to enter the city of Geneva, directly from Rochester, carried company dignitaries and invited guests, and was the cause for great celebration. Informally, cars from Geneva had run as far as Gate substation for some time to meet cars coming from Canandaigua and Rochester. The Rochester and Eastern cars came down Castle Street in Geneva and stopped at a terminal near the intersection with Exchange Street. In Geneva, there was no merging with the local streetcar line, nor was there any sharing of track. It wasn't necessary in Geneva like it was in Canandaigua. Besides, the Geneva streetcars were owned and operated by a rival electric railroad group headquartered in Syracuse and known, as I mentioned before, as the BB Syndicate. And those of you that are familiar with downtown Geneva <clears throat> can look at this map that comes from one of Sheldon King's books I'll mention later. And it pretty clearly shows you the route of the Geneva streetcars in, that, in the business district of Geneva and then the route down Castle Street of the r &E. Close, but not together. In 1905, the Vanderbilt interests associated with the New York Central Railroad gained control of the r and &E and several other electric lines. They did that by purchasing a controlling share in the r and &E, the Sodus Bay Line, and the Rochester Railway Line increasing the capital stock of the r and &E by some $14 million and having the r and &E purchase stocks in several other upstate trolley lines. The Vanderbilt interests, as they were called, <clears throat> wanted to get more control over the passenger business, over rates, and over, prof over profits. In 1903, the Rochester and Eastern Rapid Railway, the route of the Orange Limited, took over the street railroad and brought interurban service to Canandaigua. The larger interurban trolley cars provided very frequent service to both Rochester and Geneva and many points between. Then in 1910, a new corporation, New York State Railways, took over control of the r and &E while closely working with those Vanderbilt interests. In fact, one of the corporate officers of the new corporation was none other than William K. Vanderbilt, grandson of the founder of the New York Central. Like the r and &E, most small local trolley lines shortly became part of a highly competitive big business conglomerate. And I don't think anything shows you that better than the picture that you see here. New York State Railways was only one of several large mergers of streetcar and interurban companies. While the r and &E cars continued to maintain their own identity, most of the time anyway, the line was part of a larger corporate organization after 1912, controlled in turn by an even larger organization. This family tree gives you some idea of the size and scope of New York State Railways. And I've, I've added off to the left side there <clears throat> a little notice for the r and &E with an arrow pointing to the part of this diagram that represents the Rochester and Eastern. And right behind that uh, is the uh, circle that represents the former corporation of Ontario Light and Traction. So just to, to clarify, <clears throat> uh, that horse car line established in Canandaigua had its franchise bought by an electric streetcar line, which in turn was swallowed by an even bigger electric streetcar line, uh, which in turn was swallowed by the Rochester and Eastern, which in turn was merged into New York State Railways. The Rochester lines of the New York State Railways included the Rochester City streetcar lines and another interurban line, the Rochester and Sodus Bay Railway, completed in 1900, just before the construction of the R&E. 
Through the 1920s, the interurban trolley lines, like the Rochester and Eastern, were very popular. Trolleys were fast and could be flagged down at many crossroads, especially where there was a company shelter. Along a stretch of several miles west of the village of Victor, <clears throat> the rails of the Rochester and Eastern paralleled the New York Central. When the opportunity arose, the trolleys sometimes raced the steam railroads and nearly always won. This image of a Rochester and Eastern car racing the New York Central was made into a popular postcard. And incidentally, this is another one of those company publicity shots produced by the owners of the r and &E. To the traveling public, such a, a picture spoke volumes about the modern convenience of electric railway lines. The r and &E <clears throat> built standard passenger shelters at many places where the line crossed country, country roads. <clears throat> These flag stops filled the timetables of the r and &E and provided much more service than the steam railroads. A few of these shelter buildings can still be found along the old line today. This one was near the intersection of what is now County Road 4 and Algerine Street in Hopewell. The trolleys were not only quick, but they were frequent and cheap. They were an attractive alternative to the steam roads and stopped or made pickups in many more convenient places. Unlike the former streetcar lines, <clears throat> the Rochester and Eastern had no plans to close down for the winter months, December through April. A great inconvenience. The R&E purchased a snowplow that could be used to clear the tracks after winter snowstorms. During the years of the R&E's operation, <clears throat> the snow accumulation was much more than we are used to today. And this just proves it. <clears throat> the 30 years during which the R&E operated saw heavy winter snowfalls. The automobile had just arrived in the area. I'll say a little bit more about that toward the end. And there was little thought given to plowing streets and roads back then. Plowing was critical to the operation of the trolleys, however, since they did not have sufficient power to force their way through the drifts, and even small amounts of ice on tracks and switches could derail the cars. Here, you can see Main Street, Canandaigua on a typical winter day. The r and &E snowplow is approaching the camera, but still in the distance. Branching out from an urban center, the Rochester, like Rochester, the, the electric interurban railways could bring passengers right into the heart of cities. They gave a boost to the idea of commuting from the suburbs that they helped create. And they brought customers to the new department stores, schools, and other city attractions. In larger towns like Canandaigua and Geneva, as I mentioned earlier, the Rochester and Eastern also brought in shoppers, provided a means to access the larger cities, and encouraged the newly developing tourist industry. At Canandaigua, the r and &E provided connections with several steam railroads serving the entire Northeast. Local service on the same rails took riders to the pier where passengers could board a steamboat or one of the lake resorts. Geneva also provided important travel and transportation connections. It was a long established station on the Auburn branch of the New York Central, linking Finger Lakes towns. Geneva was also an important stop on the Lehigh Valley Railroad main line, linking New York City and Buffalo and traversing the central Finger Lakes region uh, as far away as Ithaca, for example. The Middlesex branch of the Lehigh Valley provided a link to Naples from Geneva. The local streetcar line connected Geneva to Waterloo, Seneca Falls, 
Cayuga Lake Park, and Auburn. And then, of course, there were the Seneca Lake steamboats that called Geneva their home port. The big interurban cars of the R&E did not go all the way to the Canandaigua Lakefront. The line turned down Phelps Street and out what was then called County House Road on its way to Geneva. That today is known as County Road 46. Here you can see one of the big cars making the turn toward Geneva off Main Street. The r and &E was originally powered by a coal-fired generating station on Lower Main Street near Canandaigua Lake. Today, that site is occupied by the former Wegmans Plaza, including several shops, a restaurant, and the Lakeshore branch of Canandaigua National Bank. A powerhouse and a car barn were built there after, this is important, after, the R&E organization sought and got the village of Canandaigua to purchase the land for them. One of the things that the interurban companies frequently did was to require the local communities to make the initial right-of-way purchases and use the doctrine of eminent domain to do it. <clears throat> In 1906, the R&E entered into a contract to purchase high voltage power generated at the major power station at Niagara Falls. From then on, the former power station in Canandaigua served as merely another substation. For most of its operational time, the r &E maintained its corporate offices in the car barn next door. The generating station and the car barn were conveniently located on a spur line of the Pennsylvania Railroad that led from the Canandaigua Railroad Yard down to City Pier. While most of the r and &E infrastructure was right-of-way and bridges, the road did invest in three substantial brick power substations used to boost power near the extreme ends of the line. All three of those substations at Victor, Pittsford and Gates at the corner of Gates Road on County Road 4 are still standing today and they have long been repurposed, often several times. The Gates substation is now a private residence. The Victor substation was the Victor Free Library for many years and is now a veterinarian's office. The Pittsford substation, somewhat enlarged and several times remodeled, has long been a restaurant in that village. The Rochester and Eastern maintain freight and express offices in both Canandaigua and Geneva. The Canandaigua office on Phoenix Street downtown near Maine is shown in this picture. It still stands remodeled as a local restaurant next to the former Merrill Hose Company. The Geneva Express office was tucked into a business block on the east side of Castle Street near Exchange. Here you can see the building and a close-up of one of the R&E cars occupying an enclosed stop. A Y track in the street there allowed R&E cars to enter the building, then back out using the Y to have them face back toward Canandaigua and Rochester. Tickets could be purchased at these offices or on board the trolleys. And they also delivered small packages here. Like most electric railways of their time, the r and &E promoted itself as an escape to scenic vacation wonders, if only for a long day. In this early r and &E special timetable, <clears throat> You can see that the line is promoting steamboat travel on Seneca Lake and visits to the wonders of Watkins Glen. At that time, the Glen itself was just transitioning in 1906, two years after this timetable, from a private attraction to a somewhat controversial state park. In fact, the r and &E had just started service to Geneva when this promotional timetable was issued. So they 
wasted no time in opening the interurban line to Geneva and then promoting the idea that people coming in on the trolley line would be able to catch a steamboat to Watkins Glen. The separate Geneva streetcar line was focused on transporting passengers to Waterloo, Seneca Falls, and especially to Cayuga Lake Park. By 1906, the RNE was publishing scenic postcards that made patrons and local residents aware of the scenic wonders along the line. This combination card shows each of the scenes that became separate postcards, a favorite way of communicating a century ago and good advertising. You can see in the upper left that picture of the race between the electric car and the steam railroad, and on the lower right, uh, that bridge over the Erie Canal, and in between uh, scenes from the town of Victor and Farmington, uh, showing the line going through what was then pretty bucolic countryside. One of the reasons for the r &E absorbing the streetcar line in Canandaigua was to get access to its right-of-way straight down Main Street. For more than 20 years, the dinky streetcars continued to operate. The larger r &E cars also provided some local service, however, on the same tracks. <clears throat> Getting access to the center of the street meant that the r &E would no longer have to insist on cutting the Main Street trees. It also meant that they had the privilege of the original franchise to move freight down Main Street uh, onto one of those side streets, onto Phoenix Street. Looking to the future, however, and looking at this scene, it is easy to see how the large interurban cars became incompatible and even dangerous to the operators of automobiles. <clears throat> By 1930, paved streets and roads and ever more cars made the trolley irrelevant. This picture was taken in Canandaigua shortly after 1932. You can see the old trolley tracks ending at the New York Central Crossing with the overhead wires for the trolley still in place. For several years after the r &E was abandoned, the company kept the overhead wires hot in an attempt to discourage people from taking them down and selling them for scrap. When the Rochester and Eastern Rapid Railway was built, the roads we now take for granted had not yet been paved or improved. The trolley made it possible for people to get from small hamlets and crossroad shelters quickly into Geneva, Canandaigua, or even Rochester. All the while, however, there was a movement afoot to turn roads like Hamilton Street into the routes five and 20 that we know today. The automobile caught the attention of the public in a more personal way than the marvel of electric trolley cars. <clears throat> Many hometown papers proudly publicized the local arrival of the automobile. Those events happened about the same time in most communities around here. <clears throat> A local merchant, Fred W. Kindy, brought the first automobile to Canandaigua in May of 1900. At nearly the same time, D.J. Van Auken of Geneva brought the first automobile into that community. Other cars appeared on Geneva's streets shortly thereafter. The bottom article on the right mentions that a Rochesterian drove to Geneva in 1903, no mean feat at the time, apparently just to see if he could do it. It took two hours. By 1909, the state was building and, de and designating, even numbering, state highways. It had already been subsidizing the building of local roads by counties and towns 
since 1898. By 1919, the Finger Lakes Association was promoting a series of public paved roads that would circle the main Finger Lakes. All of those developments slowly strangled the trolley companies and the steam railroads as well. Nevertheless, the paved highway seemed like a boon to travel and tourist business. When the main road from Geneva to Canandaigua was paved in the 1920s, local promoters pushed to have it officially named Broadway. If you've traveled Route 332 north out of Canandaigua recently, you may marvel at this image. Both the New York Central and the r and &E crossed what was then called simply the Rochester Road. When this picture was taken, the road had just been paved. Johnson Crossing, as this place was known, was getting a bad reputation for the number of collisions between automobiles and trolleys that took place here, some of them fatal. Safety on the highways was becoming a hue and cry and an issue favoring automo automobiles. And so as this headline from the Ithaca Journal, April 9th, 1931 indicates, the final days of the trolley car were even then being recognized. It had been a year since the last car on the Rochester and Eastern had made the run to Geneva. The trolley cars of the New York State Railways were being gathered at the Blossom Road yards in Rochester, awaiting the scrapper's torch. The final trolley on the r and &E rolled into Geneva on July 31st, 1930. No more interurbans used the well-kept roadbed or drew power from the overhead wires. Hoping against hope, the company maintained the line for two years until it was finally totally abandoned in 1932. As early as 1929, New York State Railways entered the bus business. That year, they got a permit to provide local bus service in Canandaigua. In Rochester, New York State Railways entered the bus business in a big way, running those streetcar replacements for years. The transit token illustrated on the right here was used by students in the city school district there for, to uh, use the, the buses rather than the trolleys to get to schools in the city of Rochester. By midsummer 1932, most of the trolley poles, wires, and rails used by the R&E were removed and sold for scrap by the end of the summer. Syracuse and Auburn scrap dealers also purchased the machinery and the power stations. Then the buildings were sold. The Gate substation and the Seneca Castle station both sold for $500 each. Passenger shelters went for $7. Rochester Gas and Electric purchased the transmission lines for $207. 51 parcels of right-of-way that crossed farms and private property were sold to those interested for $5 apiece. 64 more were sold later for similar prices. It was the depth of the Great Depression but those were bargain basement prices even then. A decade later, in October 1942, the city of Canandaigua sold the 3.5 miles of rails embedded in its streets to the city, to the US government rather, for wartime scrap. The $9,000 received reportedly paid for the removal and the paving over of the street damage. It has now been more than 90 years since the Rochester and Eastern ceased operations. There are still reminders of its existence all along the route, if you know where to look. Some are as simple as bridge abutments. Some are as obvious as one of the substations. And one of the passenger shelters has now been transformed into a shed. 
Of the reminders of the RNA, however, there are fewer found each year. Whole sections of the roadbed, once part of the bucolic countryside, are included in suburban backyards. That's the case of this scene that I actually took in 1968 outside the village of Victor. Uh, today, when you look down that roadbed, you're looking through a housing development. Trolley poles that remained standing for more than half a century have been removed to make way for subdivisions. Along the entire line, there is only one historical marker to remind the public that there once was such a thing as the Rochester and Eastern Rapid Railway. It stands in the village of Victor near the old substation, along with a stretch of right-of-way now part of the Auburn Trail and a linear park. If you visit the New York Museum of Transportation on East River Road, south of Rochester and the RIT campus, you can see one of the r &E cars preserved. You can also take a ride on an operating trolley car, although it was not part of the r &E fleet. There are several other good trolley museums in the Northeast where you can have a real trolley experience and see how that important episode in transportation history has been preserved. That, that is if we all get through the, the COVID experience. There are several more than those that are mentioned here in this slide. And if you'd like to know more about the Rochester and Eastern in particular, Two books have been written about that line and New York State Railways. William R. Gordon's 1953 publication should be on the must read list of anyone interested in the r &E. It has been reprinted, I believe by Heart of the Lakes Publishing Company and is widely available on internet sites and in many public libraries. Sheldon King's book about New York State Railways is also well worth the small expense of getting a copy, and it too is widely available. The story of the Geneva streetcars can be found on the internet. Bud Smith's article on railroads and trolley lines of Geneva is easy to find. It was written for the Geneva Historical Society in 1987. Sheldon King also published two other small books about the Geneva Waterloo Seneca Falls streetcar line. They too are easy to find and very informative. But there are two hefty books about interurban trolleys and their impact on the America of the early 20th century. They were published in 1960 and 1961. Many libraries have one or the other, and they also are easy to obtain from internet booksellers and public libraries. Finally, in addition to the books just mentioned, a 54 minute video produced in 1991 is well worth watching, although it is a bit more difficult to find. It was first produced as a VHS videotape in 1999, it was converted to DVD format. The video documentary includes a great deal of film footage of trolleys operating in the 1900 to 1930 time period. It can really enhance your understanding of the streetcars and interurbans, although none of those shown in the documentary were located in the Rochester, Canandaigua, or Geneva area. And so, I thank you for spending some time today, this evening, learning about the Rochester and Eastern, the route of the Orange Limited. It uh, played an important part in linking Rochester with two of the important communities in the Northern Finger Lakes region. The trolleys are gone, but they and their impact are not forgotten. Well, thank you very much, Preston. Uh, that was really interesting. And I know I learned a lot, especially some of the differences between the two trolleys in Geneva, which I've always had some difficulty keeping straight. So that was helpful. 
does anyone have any questions? We didn't have, we had a couple comments in the chat, but there were no questions. I don't know if anyone has any questions for Preston uh, and, and about the program of the trolleys, uh, the Rochester and Eastern. Do we just uh, ask a question? Um, we might as well do it that way. <laughs> if you want to just that unmute works. yourself, if you have a question, uh, feel free to just take turns. Preston, nice job. Um, is this being recorded and would it be available after tonight? Yes, it's my yes. understanding <laughs> that the Geneva Historical Society did record it and uh, Anne or somebody there will, will have to tell you about its availability. I think it, she said they were going to put it up on the website. Yes, it will be added to our digital collection materials. Uh, not sure the timeline when, but we will put it there. You will see we've got one program from our history sandwiched in and we will try to put various programs up there when we have permission to record and we remember to do it. <laughs> but this one is recorded. Any other questions? Oh, um, a written question. Uh, Preston, do you know anything about a BB private railroad car? You know, I've heard about that, but I have to just say no. That's the simple answer. I can't dance around it. I don't know anything about it, <laughs> except that it existed. Okay. Well, we also had several comments from Pamela Whedon, uh, who says she also has some memorabilia, if you're interested. Um, I, I, if I understood correctly, one of her comments earlier was... Um, that let's see uh her great grandmother harriet jones was the station master uh here i'm not sure where she here is. did you want to share more about that pamela oops let's see there's a number of messages in here let me just scroll through yeah. it looks like pamela's uh muted on, on my screen. So okay. maybe that's the issue. You might need to unmute yourself, Pamela, so we can hear. Hey, I've unmuted myself. You are, you are audible now. I grew, up, I grew up in Geneva. Um, I live in Richmond, Virginia now, and I was very excited to see that one picture of the Richmond trolley car. Um, my great grandmother, Harriet Jones, was a station master at the station in Seneca Castle. Oh, my, um, she had a daughter, my grandmother, who married an Otley, and my grandparents Otley lived in the um, station until the road came through and then moved the building over to where it currently is now. So I have a lot of pictures, and I also have some newspaper articles that she had saved if Mr. Price, Mr. Price is here, excuse me, is interested in any of that or the historical society? I would love to see the articles and the pictures. Uh, probably the easiest way to contact me is through an email these days. And uh, as Ann mentioned, I teach part-time at Finger Lakes Community College. My email is really easy. It is preston.pierce at flcc.edu. Okay, Preston.Pierce at flcc.edu. Correct. Okay, I would, I would, I'll send you some stuff within the next week or so. I would just ask that you perhaps check your spam folder because my spam because my nephew could never separate the two words, and a lot of times my emails go into people's spam folders. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, we have a few other questions. If I can scroll, uh, trying to keep everything on my screen, which isn't that big as a bit tricky here. Um, let's see, get back. Uh, is uh, what is a dinky? Uh, was one question. Is it a type oh. of trolley car? Well, it was a slang term. I don't know if it was used anywhere else, but it was a slang term used in Canada to describe those first electric trolley cars. They, they operated on just four wheels, unlike the bigger interurban cars that had eight wheels. And uh, it, it was, as you could see in the picture, obviously much smaller than the, the interurban cars. Uh, I never defined the term interurban. There's not much of a definition for it. The, the interurban cars were bigger. Uh, 
they were obviously built to go fairly long distances as opposed to the, the street cars that were meant to just cruise around the streets of a small town. Okay, well, and we also had a question from Rick. What was the function of the gate station? I assume that's the one that you had the picture of. Oh, at Gates, eventually at Canandaigua, uh, at Victor and at Pittsburgh, they boosted the uh, voltage for the for the trolleys. There, there was. I'm not. I'm not an electrical engineer by any means. <laughs> but, uh, I do know that uh, when you send power through a wire, uh, the further you send it, the more the voltage drops. And at those substations, they were able to boost the voltage back up so that there was sufficient voltage in the lines to operate the whole thing from Geneva to Rochester. Ah, and there may be more int uh, information on, apparently there is a website on the Rochester and Eastern uh, from our chat here. Uh, somebody did indicate that. I don't think now I'm not going to be able to find that one. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if the uh, address was, I don't think the address was given, but perhaps if there is, some of those questions might be uh, answered there. Then uh, another question from Marty, uh, were there any lines going west from Rochester? And I feel like there yes. were in the map that I used to advertise this program. There was, there, that, that syndicate uh, out of Syracuse had uh, two longer interurban lines. One, the Rochester, Syracuse, and Eastern that ran through uh, from Rochester to, uh, to Fairport, to Palmyra, to Newark, to Lyons, and on into, uh, into Syracuse. <coughs> and then west of Rochester, <coughs> excuse me, gotta get a drink here. West of Rochester, there were actually two a short one uh, ran out along the, the western shore of uh, Lake Ontario to Manitou Beach and the hotels out there, basically out along the, the, the lake shore of what is now the town of Greece. But the big one was the Rochester Lockport and Buffalo, and it connected Rochester and the city of Buffalo. Hmm. And I know I had spoken to Preston before we started there. Um, I grew up in Irondequoit and uh, there was a trolley lot. We always called it the lot when I was a kid, which I believe was part of the line that ran up um, to Seabreeze, probably bringing vacationers up to that area as well. Uh, we also had, oh, thank you. Uh, Kenneth May put in the uh, chat the address for the website. It's the rochesterandeastern.com. So if you want to check that out, anyone who has further questions, you can take a look at that website. Also, um, did, oh, let's see, the, um, was the trolley system AC or DC? It was AC. AC, okay. Right. Um, how long in miles was the peanut line and what was its purpose? Oh, well, that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> <laughs> the peanut line was the, the steam railroad that went from Canandaigua to Niagara Falls originally and went through the countryside, Canandaigua to East Bloomfield to uh, Ionia to, uh, you know, it, it jumped across the Genesee River and went on to Caledonia and Batavia and West. Uh, it really not related to the to the Rochester and Eastern in any way, but it's a, it's another fascination of mine. And if you had another half an hour here, I'd be glad to uh, talk your ear off about the trolley line, about the the peanut line. Um, and I'm trying to keep up. We've got lots of questions coming in. Um, do you have an idea of what an average fare cost Geneva to Rochester in or about 1920? Well, that's quite specific. <laughs> yeah. Um, right at the top of my fingertips, I don't. Uh, actually, I have a 1925 uh, copy of a 1925 timetable in my hands right now. And it doesn't specify the fare, but it, it was, uh, I think originally, uh, I wanna guess about all the way from Geneva to Rochester, 
might have been uh, 25 cents originally and, and went up from there? I, I do recall um, in doing a school program a number of years ago, coming across references to a nickel fare, but I don't know if that was just sort of a general average cost or if that was the Geneva trolley, because um, there was an article advocating for buying an automobile because in the long run, it would be cheaper to own the automobile than pay the nickel fare for your seven children and your wife on the trolley every time you wanted to go out of town. So uh, that was, that sticks in my head, but that seems too cheap for all the way to, to Rochester, certainly not by 1920. Well, the, the financing of the trolleys, like the steam railroads, was uh, a little more complicated than the, the financing for automobiles. You know, when you buy an automobile, uh, you pay for the automobile and the insurance and the gasoline and so forth, but you don't have to pay except through your taxes for any infrastructure. And that's one of the things that the trolley companies and the other railroad companies always objected to. When they ran a line of track, say from Geneva to Rochester, they had to pay property taxes on that line through, through every community they went through. On the other hand, once the state uh, and, uh, and the counties and the towns began to build highways for people to drive their cars on, uh, you know, nobody had to directly pay for the use of any of that, except in the, insofar as it was part of their property taxes. So the, the railroads always complained about that. And today that's a hot issue in the transportation field between railroads and, uh, and airports. Uh, cities tend to come up with the money to pay for airports that airlines use for a small fee Whereas uh, Amtrak has to uh, buy the property and, and pay for a building for a passenger station. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've, I've heard that that uh, was the case in the early 20th century as well. Subsidies for Firestone and for Ford and for a lot of the car right. companies and the infrastructure that were not offered to other types of public transportation. And I think it's a mark of uh, the fact that this was a business uh, that uh, at the end, the New York State Railways got into the bus business. And uh, they, especially in the city of Rochester, uh, once the streetcars were gone for quite a long time, the, the buses that ran around the streets of Rochester were also owned and operated by that same New York State Railways. They just tore up the rails and, and uh, junked the streetcars and, and uh, went for the buses. I think they did the same in Geneva as well. Um, okay, the, this was quite some time ago. It's one I missed earlier. The Rochester Geneva line was never directly connected to the Waterloo Geneva line. You had to get off one and get on the other. Is that correct? The, uh, say that again. Um, the, I believe the question is, was the Rochester Geneva line, it was never connected, the Rochester and Eastern piece to right. the that, one that correct. went out to Cayuga Lake State Park. It, was, it Park. was easy to catch one of the Geneva streetcars because they came uh, right down Exchange Street within a few feet of the Geneva terminal for the r &E. So the r &E would come in, come down Castle Street and, and go to the terminal there on Castle Street, and you were like maybe half a block from Exchange Street where you could pick up one of the Geneva streetcars. Okay. But there was never any interchange between them. The, the reason there was in Canandaigua was that the r &E wanted the franchise that the streetcars had for using the middle of Main Street and being able to move freight on Main Street. Um. How does the time frame of these trolleys compare to the time frame in other parts of the US as far as the interurbans in other cities? Well, except for major cities, you know, there are there are a few places today where there are interurbans today, they call them light rail and a few other terms that are used, but uh, it's pretty much the same. Uh, there, there are a few places today where there are uh, interurban cars that will carry you 
between towns or the, the links of a community. But uh, those are all places like, well, best example I think is Chicago. Uh, but also the same is true of Boston and Philadelphia and certainly of New York. Uh, there's, there's, they've been cut way back in recent years. Uh, there's, there's always the, the issue of getting them off the streets because they're a real safety hazard. Uh, you know, you can, you can well imagine, you saw that one picture of the r &E car in the middle of Main Street. Think of what would happen if that car and those tracks were still there today, given the traffic that's on Canada was Main Street today, and, and you'd have cars trying to pass and duck around all of these uh, interurban cars on the street. So where those things exist today, they're trying to get them on private right-of-way. Uh, I rode uh, a, a car from suburban Chicago uh, into downtown uh, two summers ago, uh, and virtually the entire line now runs down uh, what is basically the, the, the median between the, 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 the two lanes of traffic. It'd be like being in the middle of the throughway or, or <laughs> 90, and you've got the rails running down the center and the cars running two ways on either side. Which is, I think, how they do some of the interurban transport in other countries where they try right. to stack them. And that makes sense. And you have one right of way, and it's, but it helps if you plan it that way from the beginning. Um, I, I don't think we have any more questions. A comment from Kenneth May, South Shore Line between South Bend and Chicago. I don't know if that was the one you were that, referring uh, to. That is another area I mentioned. Chicago, the Chicago area to include all the way into Indiana and up toward Milwaukee is uh, probably the best area in the country today to see uh, interurbans in operation. They don't look exactly like these old cars, but very close. And then um, also had a comment, if I can get it all to show up. I don't have a mouse, which makes navigating this screen a little bit trickier. Um, Alan Shank said, uh, great program. My great aunt, Ruth Shank Dakin, as a teenager, rode the R&E from our house just west of Geneva to the end of the line, transferred to the Rochester line and took lessons at the Eastman Music School. Right. And that also reminds me of uh, something I do tell school students when we talk about some of these forms of transportation. They were available to anyone who had the fare, unlike driving, which is only available to those 16 and over with a license, clean license, uh, and a car available. So they sometimes were more usable for the general public. Um, OK, and we have a question from Cam. Do you want to uh, speak that question, I'm assuming? Yes, I have a question. How many people were employed by a trolley here? Are there any statistics available about that? How did it compare with the people who were employed by the railroads? Uh, well, it's a little bit hard to compare that because, uh, you know, on the railroad, for example, you've got a conductor who might be on the the uh, say just the Auburn branch of the New York Central, that conductor might actually live in Syracuse or Auburn and simply ride the train for a certain distance each day, but actually live out of the area and, and wouldn't make it into the employment statistics for say Geneva. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you had people who were employed as ticket agents and track men and uh, you know, did, uh, other things, uh, you know, freight agents and so forth. I don't know what the uh, number of employees was. Uh, it, it's an interesting question. I'm, I'm thinking quickly about uh, how you might ascertain that. Uh, one of the ways would be at the time the trolleys were around to go to uh, uh, city directories in Canada and, and Geneva both produce directories almost every year in the early years of the 20th century. And those directories listed uh, all of the people who lived in all of the various mailing addresses in the community. And they usually had some statement about what their occupation was. 
So you could go through the directories and you could try to identify people who worked for one or another of the railroads and, and uh, do a, a, a very crude comparison that way. I'm not sure that uh, it's been almost 100 years. That's before the time of the income tax. Uh, I'm not really sure if there are records that would t uh, tell us very much about that, but it's an interesting question, certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't, oh, every time I think we're done, there's another question that pops up. Have you done programs on the New York Central Auburn Road and the Pennsylvania Railroad Elmira branch? I don't, I'm assuming that question is to you, Preston. A long time ago, I, uh, I did a program on the uh, uh, Elmira branch of uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad. Uh, it, it would be fun to, uh, to put one of those together. Uh, I'm not looking for a job in the next couple of months <laughs> to come back and, and do this, uh, but I, I would love to. I've always been very interested in, in both of those. And the other thing that I'm very interested in is the Lehigh Valley. There's, a, there, there's really quite a story behind the Lehigh Valley. And it's, it's interesting that uh, the Rochester and Eastern uh, is opened up uh, really between its creation in 1902 and, and the first car rolling from Rochester to Geneva in 1904. And the, the Lehigh Valley had only been in operation itself for about 10 years when that happened. So the Lehigh Valley was the newest of the steam railroads in the area, and it went in a very different direction than what the others did. Uh, and I, I've always been very interested in the Lehigh Valley. Uh, many people in this area don't realize that there really is a place called the Lehigh Valley with a, a river called the Lehigh River that runs through it. Uh, it's, uh, that's where Allentown and Bethlehem and Easton, Pennsylvania are. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd love to get an invite to do something about the Lehigh Valley, but not, <laughs> not the next six months. You have it takes enough on a lot of time to put all these things together. We have, the Historical Society has had programs on those topics in the past. Um, we had one on the New York Central just a couple of years ago, live and in person, and we don't have a recording of it. Um, it was about 20 years ago that we had one on the Lehigh Valley. Um, Mary Dan did a presentation on that. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm sure there is uh, a lot more out there. So we will keep that in mind. I know but she wrote a book about right. the Lehigh Valley. Yes, she did. She did. And she gave a wonderful presentation about 20 years ago for me. Um, so we've, uh, and I can see we've got the thumbs up on that in our chat. So I know there's a lot of railroad fans out there. <laughs> we will see. We've had quite a few programs in the last few years um, on those topics, but uh, there's always possibility they'll show up again. And there's something for you, Marty, for Antiques Club as well, because I did neglect to mention that Antiques Club has a program next Thursday. It is not on rail, uh, it is on beer. So if you're interested, we do have more uh, conversations coming up on local history, but a different, slightly different variety. Though I'm sure there are ways you could cross those two together, the brewing and the trolleys and the railroads probably do all uh, combine. I think we've gotten all of our questions out, um, unless there's any last minute ones. Uh, I, we had a lot of thanks also in the chat to you, Preston. And I want to thank you. It was a, a really wonderful presentation, a lot of great pictures and really good information. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for being here. <laughs> uh, wouldn't do much good to put together a, a, a program if nobody showed up. So <laughs> you had a good audience, about attention. 50 people. So that's, that's very good. It would have been crowded at the Hawker Gallery, so I'm glad we were able to do it virtually. Thank you all for coming. Please do keep an eye on our calendar for other future events and upcoming programs. We will keep your suggestions in mind. And uh, thanks again. Um, if you have further questions or think of things after the fact, you can always email me through the Historical Society's website and I can send any questions on to Preston as well. So thank you. <laughs>